Thank Colin Kaepernick for awakening a dormant pride. You see, the 49er quarterback had been protesting police brutality and racial inequities by sitting or kneeling during the playing of the national anthem. Now, I originally applauded his decision to make a stand, but as many black folks that I know felt, it was a novel gesture, but hapless nonetheless. See, people have been protesting all across the country since the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson in 2014, and people are still dying. What the hell was this kneeling going to do? And then the rooster crow. I was watching Undisputed, and I noticed Shannon Sharp dropping jewels. He pointed out that we don't sing the third stanza of the national anthem. And he said, Here's a guy that owned slaves that said, the land of the free. But as a slave, I'm not free. So what am I to be proud of? Well, hell, now I need to find out what the hell he's talking about third stanza. Never knew there was one. So I Googled it. And there it was. No refuge can save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. So basically, I've been singing and giving honor to a poem that illuminates the demise of people of my color. Yet, it's what's missing from this entire poem that makes me question what he was more elated with, the defeat of the British or the demise of the slave. For there is no mention or description of the British in a song that is supposed to celebrate the U.S. standing up to the British. Not a red coat, or Englishman, or any reference to the primary enemy. Nope, its only clear designation is that of the slave, black people. So now I'm in a twist. You know, what do I do with this new knowledge, this new awareness? So I decided to research the author and his mindset as recorded by history. Upon learning that this was supposedly written while he was on a British vessel after the English had sailed the hell out of Fort McHenry, I was forced to wonder if the omission of any indication of their actual adversaries, the British, was also a sign of cowardice. Or maybe he was a tried and true racist. You see, he believed that blacks were, quote, a distinct and inferior race of people, which all experience proves to be the greatest evil that afflicts a community. <laughs> Slave owner, coward, racist. Take your pick, but I ain't singing this damn song again. My 14-year-old daughter asked me why I felt like this, and I told her that I had faced or dealt with different levels of racism and prejudices my whole life. That although we, as a black community, cry out for equitable inclusion as citizens, we are also taught not to make waves. Got a roll with the punches. But at the moment, I was punch weary. From one of the earliest instances in my young life as a child in elementary school to interactions with the police, I've turned the other cheek or tried to let shit slide. I'm sick of that. There's a saying that I like a fish doesn't know it's wet. I need my daughter to have an understanding of the waters that she swims in. Without inspired reflection, the scar tissue of racial assaults on my life had been buried. And now, a few of those memories were being resurrected. I told her of my first known instance of racism as a kid living in Oakland, California. It's 1968, and my memory of Oakland is highlighted by the presence of the Black Panthers and a white group of bikers known as the Hells Angels. And from everything I knew, which was very little at five years old, these guys didn't like black people. The news of the day was filled with tensions between whites and blacks. But one of my first playmates in Oakland was a white kid. Let's call him Tommy. We played on the schoolyard of E. Morris Cox Elementary School every day, playing tag, hopscotch, tetherball, you name it. Then one day after school, he brought me to his house. We were latchkey kids. You know, nobody home when you get out of school. So when I see his room, I was in awe. You see, my mother, the uber conservative, made me keep my room pristine and straight. Walls, clean and bare. Pop and soul music were the sounds of my home. Fried chicken and watermelon were staples, not stereotypes. But here was this guy with posters of long-haired guys with guitars on his wall. 
and other menacing looking guys with long hair and beards on motorcycles. And the helmet that his father gave him that I years later realized was shaped like a Nazi helmet. He liked to listen to this guitar whining, hard screaming, and loud music known then as hard rock. You know, Sabbath, Zeppelin, The Doors, all that shit. <laughs> I remember he used to wear this black leather biker bracelet and this wide black leather belt with double holes and a blue jean vest jacket like the bikers wore. Funny. We dressed nothing alike, listened to none of the same music, and enjoyed few of the same freedoms. Yet, he and I played together at school every day. And then one day it ended. His mother's boyfriend, a biker, didn't like the idea of him associating with me. I guess he didn't want any little nigger boys around him or his people. Regardless of this reason, my friend couldn't be my friend anymore because of the color of my skin. My mother's answer was not to address it with confrontation, but to accept that some people were like that, so deal with it. The precept of being black with the mother that was a try to fit into the white man's world conservative led me to have no real understanding of what had happened or why at that time. Unfortunately for me, there would be many more over the, over the coming years. I have witnessed and been prey to the ugly necessity for a cloaked sense of white superiority. I was cussed at, spat at, thrown at, and shot at by mostly white folks all before I ever turned 13, and all based on the color of my skin. The only place that the darkness of my skin didn't seem to be a hindrance was when I would visit my dad. Now my dad was a dashiki wearing big afro sporting black actor. He was director for the Center for Black Studies at Wayne State University. Every spring, we marched. Every summer, we attended the African festivals. All the people he associated with, white, black, brown, whatever, treated me as if I belonged, as if my color wasn't a detriment. Everybody was brother or sister. You were either greeted in Swahili or with Asalaamu Alaikum. And the handshakes were never conventional. The same ones you would see on black shows like What's Happening or Good Times. But with my mom, it was different. My own people, black people, ridiculed and teased me all the time about being so dark. They called me black ass, crow, shadow, dot, all types of shit. In the summer, I would get darker. Being dark skinned was not cool then. Shaft and Sidney Poitier were the exception to the rule. I remember one time my own mother looking at me and asking me, why did I have to play out in the sun so much? Real black was real black. But I took it. I had to accept all this racist shit that happened to me. Bumper skiing on an unmarked police car with the white kid in the fifth grade, I was the only one that was busted for it. The white kid was let go with the warning. The principal called my mom. Beating ensued. Man, it sucked to be a black kid. But how about the time in high school at Southfield High when a buddy and I walked past a group of white senior and junior boys heading into the school building? As we passed them, we made eye contact and nodded. Within the next 15 seconds, the window on the door in front of a spider web from the impact of some projectile. The sound of a low, sharp crack registered in my head. We turned to see one of the guys holding a rifle and several of the guys laughing. We took off running. We went inside to the office and reported it. By the time the assistant principal got outside to investigate, the rifle was gone. And the guys said it wasn't them. All we got was, sorry, with no evidence, there's nothing we can do. And he dismissed them. But you knew he knew it was true. These guys were laughing while denying it. Damn, the blacks got no back. I explained to my daughter that all racism isn't deployed in direct violence and not always intentional. My first serious relationship was with a Filipina whose father had a prejudice against me because I am black and because I'm a Marine. As an Asian in the Navy, he was grouped with the blacks who he later shared with me were treated like shit. So this proud Filipino thought it was fucked up that he had to be with people that were considered to be less than. 
and he was determined not to let his family experience the same shames and ridicules that he witnessed and endured by association. So when he met me with my dark skin and flashy ride and earring in my ear, he didn't see a happy future for his daughter. <laughs> her mother slammed the door in my face uh, after answering the doorbell. He hounded her for her relationship with me. Whoops, too late, Papa's firstborn is pregnant. Now, she had been pregnant before, I'm told, by a white guy, but the response was much more tepid. They were too young. But a pregnancy by me? <coughs> oh shit, daddy's girl has thrown her life away. This left our relationship strained before I flew overseas to Okinawa, Japan. Shortly after arriving, I received a message through the Red Cross to call her. There was an emergency. She told me she had lost a baby in the fall while arguing and fighting with her father. Then she said goodbye. Relationship over. Fade to black. As I recall many other moments in my life that I can attribute in action or inaction based on my color, I realized that the most prevalent ones were those that were hidden or unaddressed. I also realized that the consciousness of color and race is relevant to your time, environment, and experience. So I decided that I'm not going to sing or recite words to this racist-inspired poem. And I wish black singers would stop singing it also. As a veteran, I will stand for the flag. The America I live in now is not the America of those times, or at least it pretends not to be. We need a new national anthem. I like America the Beautiful. It's all inclusive and more representative of the diversity by which we currently live. Black folks have been looking for a seat at the table for some time now, but the menu is old and stained. I want to be welcome, but what good is an invitation to dine when you know I like collard greens, but you steady want to force feed me fermented cabbage? <laughs> Stay classy, San Diego. Thank you. Good night.